Good news everyone, if you've ever wanted to own a home near Lake Mead, well a whole bunch of new land has just appeared. Bad news, it's because at this point calling it Lake Mead is a little bit charitable. I guess whole Mead doesn't have the same ring to it. You see, this lack of water we're seeing right now is ruining a lot more than just vacation plans. A whole bunch of states have just lawyered up to engage in a fight for diminishing returns. The problem here? Well, it's really simple. A whole lot of states need water, not a whole lot of water to be given. If everyone keeps taking at the rates that have been assigned to them in previous agreements leading up to this point, well, there's going to be negative water left flowing out of the Colorado River. So this brings us to a more complicated question. In that case, who should reduce their water intake? Now this is where a simple problem gets a very complicated solution. Wheel out the lawyers! In the distance, there's a looming threat way worse than drought facing southern states. <gasps> Federal regulations. You see, if the states can't get their act together and work out some sort of plan of sustainable water cuts by the end of August, well then the federales are kicking in the door to distribute that water for them. As Nevada's lead Colorado River negotiator puts it, the federal government doesn't have scalpels, they have broadswords. So there you have it, we got a ticking clock on the map. You're either motivated by survival instincts or states rights, something for everyone. The question now is, how do you cut usage by 2-4 to four million acre feet in 2023, which amounts to Arizona's entire annual intake, if not more. Now this is where the strategically minded lawyers start coming in. You see, if you go by the treaties and agreements, well they're incredibly favorable to California and incredibly unfavorable to Arizona and Nevada. It's pretty much, well we have to cut an amount of water equivalent to Arizona's annual intake? Alright, I guess Arizona doesn't import any more water. Problem solved. Now of course Arizona's out there saying, Whoa, 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 past agreements, past achievements. We need a more equitable solution. California, you liberals eat up equitable solutions. Let's tear up all these agreements and give us a bit more water. In Arizona, a state which is supposed to bear the brunt of the cuts under past agreements, the state's principal negotiator on matters relating to the Colorado River said, Water users want the burden shouldered by other states too. Yeah guys, I'll just light the fire and we can start singing kumbaya. What do you say? Now Arizona's main point of leverage in these debates is, hey, if you enforce these agreements against us in this current water crisis, well then we're just going to refuse and push the distribution decision making up the chain of command to the Department of the Interior. You can bet that they're going to unilaterally issue a decision that nobody's going to like. So if we were following the current agreements, what would a solution look like? Well, there are two major agreements that are a thorn in Arizona's side right now. First, you got the 1922 Colorado River Compact. You see, way back then in 1922, no one was thinking to themselves, well, we're going to run out of water someday. It was the Colorado River after all. The rules back then were guy who had the biggest gun got first dibs to the water. Then America started to build dams and things started to change. Wait, wait a second, California has the biggest guns and they have the first dibs on the Colorado River water. If we don't do something, they'll be able to build their own dam and lay claim to all of the water in the river. In 1922, the Hoover Dam and the Glen Canyon Dam were going up and we had to figure out who owned what. Now this agreement among states created two separate basins, the creatively named Upper Basin and you guessed it, the other Lower Basin. The goal, prevent all these northern states from building dams and taking all of the water. Now what it did was set up two competing sets of states. You got the Upper Basin where, well they don't really matter much in this episode. The goody two shoes up there always come in under their allotted water dosage. But then you got the lower basin where, oh boy, are we setting up quite the fight. Now this cage match is between the lower basin states of Arizona, California, and Nevada. And well, Mexico got added 20 years later, but they aren't really part of these negotiations either because 
downstream and not part of America. So this compact set up the cage match. Now let's get ready to rumble! You see, the upper and lower basins were taking their allotted amounts of water. There wasn't much need for alarm. Then a six year drought happened leading to those 1922 allocation numbers looking like wishful thinking. In 2007, oh man, things had really dried up and the lower basin states found themselves facing a similar, less intense version of the exact same problem that we're seeing today. The volumes of water that they agreed to, well they just weren't there anymore. Time to start redistributing things a little bit. Negotiators came together, talked a bit, and devised a plan as to how to cut water supplies at different levels of drought. Now at this point, I could just huck a whole bunch of numbers at you and bring this episode to a screeching halt, but I'm going to be simple with it. Basically, this agreement created a few Lake Mead water levels that triggered different tranches of cuts. <clears throat> Alright, so if Lake Mead hits this water level, we're going to be alarmed. If Pond Mead hits this water level, we'll be panicked. And if Puddle Mead hits this water level, well, we're pulling the emergency ripcord. So basically, the first level, Arizona is losing 11% of their apportionment and Nevada is losing 4%. Second level, Arizona is cutting 3% and Nevada is losing another 2%. Third level, you guessed it, Arizona and Nevada are taking more hits to their water supply. Now at this point, you're probably wondering, wait, did he just forget California existed in this little debate? Nope, they're getting their water bottles supersized out there on the coast. Don't try to mess with California lawyers. Now if things get worse than third level, and according to estimates it looks like we're headed in that direction right now, an equation was created to restrict all remaining water distribution. Now this final level equation is where California finally gets some of their skin in the game. So why is that? Well water rights are a really strange beast west of the Mississippi. Basically it's fully the dibs system out there. Well Californians set dibs on the Kala River water first, so they have what we call senior water rights. Nevada and Arizona, they call dibs later, so they have junior water rights. California can take all the water they want, and everyone else gets the scraps. Now from California's perspective, they were actually being incredibly charitable to eventually surrender some of their water sovereignty in order to participate in this water compact. Does it make sense or sound fair to you? We are operating on a mindset from a post-pioneer era that, well, west coast water laws haven't caught up to yet. So all this sounds pretty official, which makes Arizona and Nevada pretty officially screwed, right? Well maybe not. You see, everything I've mentioned so far is set in interstate compacts, not in stone. Now this gives states a little more flexibility than if we were dealing with on the books laws. Politicians in Arizona and Nevada are saying, well when it comes to this river, we're not going to go with the flow. Now the word renegotiate is starting to get a lot more traction recently, which leaves us with a final question. If you want to start renegotiating things, how far back do you want to get in your renegotiations? You see, some people are saying, all right. California, they need to pay their fair share and get some of these water cuts earlier on in the trajectory. Gotta shoulder some of this burden. Others are taking a wider view of the system and saying, what's even with this upper basin, lower basin divide in the first place? I guess it made sense at the time when all these federal and state dams were being built, but we're in a different world today. You upper basin states gotta start making cuts as well. Now, of course, if you start opening and tinkering with that box, well, you got a lot more states objecting to your future plans. And then, if you want to get even crazier with it, some people are talking about just getting rid of the dibs system of water allocation altogether, and instead figuring out a more equitable way of distributing water in the first place. Now, all these groups and all these states have until August to figure out whether to stick to the compacts that they've already made or provide some sort of new compact system or regulatory system in general. It's all up in the air. 
If not everyone can agree though, well then the federales are going to kick down the door, just tear everything apart, and allocate water for the states, working with a sledgehammer instead of a chisel. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put on my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list over here of exceptional individuals by clicking on the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so the freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.